Thank you. Well, that's a good thing because uh, my English sometimes gets rusty. So. Anyway, uh, my name is Jorge Garza. I'm the founder and CEO of PP. When, uh, like Pablo said, we are the Airbnb for cars in Mexico. And before we start, and since I'm not a funny person in English, only in Spanish, I want to see a short uh, video I prepared to uh, develop the problem around Mexico traditional car rental right now. Hmm. If this will go forward, or, oh, it's the other way. <laughs> And uh, is there a place? I'm sorry, we have no mid-size available at the moment. I don't understand. I made a reservation. Do you have my reservation? Yes, we do. Unfortunately, we ran out of cars. But the reservation keeps the car here. <laughs> That's why you have the reservation. I know why we have reservations. I don't think you do. <laughs> if you did, I'd have a car. You just don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's really the most important part of the reservation, the holding. Anybody can just take them. I'm sorry, we have... Well, as funny as that may seem, this is a normal day on the traditional car rental in Mexico, where uh, check-in, check-out times can take up to 60 minutes. Uh, the reservations are not honored. And there's always hidden charges in them. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem right now is that we have a private fleet in Mexico sitting around 22 hours a day, parked, in average. So basically, we have people looking for cars and cars waiting for people. What's the size of the problem? Well, in 2021, we had 7.1 million users. And our fleet was 40.6 million cars, and that's growing every year. How did we solve the problem? Well, we developed an application where the community can actually upload their sitting cars, and the market can look for one. We do user uh, screening for both parties via MetaMap, which is uh, one of our partners. And we have super fast, less than five minutes, check-in, check-out times. We provide free insurance for the car owner during the rental. And we also have a um, rewards program regarding CO2 emissions for each rental. And that involves the car, right? So what does BP mean for the market? It's an enhanced solution. There's more variety of cars. It's better prices. There's no documentation in the process. Check-in, check-out times are a lot faster, and we are available 24 hours a day. But for the community, what does it mean? Well, it's a direct input of uh, cash into the community, into the car owners, and we provide the free insurance. And in the way that we, go, we get more cars uploaded to the platform, then there's going to be less need for the traditional industry to buy cars. Because every car that's manufactured produces 0.6 tons of CO2. <clears throat> What's the market? Well, uh, in 2021, the market just for Mexico was point point, uh, $1.77 billion. And uh, the addressable market, which is the tech-driven reservations, it's 1.1 million, and we are looking or trying to target an SOM of the mobile app uh, users, and that's uh, around $300 million a year. What's our competitive advantage for the people who know Turo? Well, Turo tried to enter the market in Latin America in general, but uh, they have cultural barriers, they have the uh, lack of knowledge of the local um, laws or traffic uh, laws in the country, and they also, their, their uh, insurance company does not cover Mexico or has no presence in Mexico. And about the rest of the companies, well, uh, we don't have the asset cost structure they do, where they have to pay depreciation, financing, insurance, maintenance, everything else involved with owning a car. Our revenue stream comes 
And I apologize for the presentation, but the migration from keynote to PowerPoint did not went well. We charge a 15% commission on rents, and um, that's for the car owner, and we also get an extra 8% commission on the insurance company. And in the future, and this is important, we plan to do some data mining of all the data we, we collect from every rental. So our current business model is a C2C, where the owner offers a price to the market. But we are working on two more models. One is where the driver actually offers a price he's willing to pay, and the, mar and the, the owners see if they can you know, offer their cars. And then we're also working on an X2B model, where either um, private own uh, private car owners or actual current rental companies can offer to uh, businesses around. This is our team, Alejandro Hernandez. He's been more than 20 years in the tech development industry. And myself, I've been more than 20 years in the traditional car rental industry, and that's where the actual idea came up. And we all already have a dev team working and marketing backend and support teams as well. And well, that's some data, which is, uh, we're running a pre-seed round to uh, get some client acquisition, tech support, and salaries and continue with the operation. And I will gladly answer any question you have. I can just park it up. <laughs> All right. okay. um, you, you appear, compared to the regular car, insurance, car rental companies, you appear to offer more feature at a lower price. What What's the major cost reduction you have compared to a traditional car company, or car rental company? The fact that we don't own the cars and the cars are owned uh, privately. So uh, we're educating the private car owners that the car, it's uh, right now the culture in Mexico is the car is like part of a treasure in the family, but we're educating them and telling them, well, owning a car costs, and it costs a lot of money. So. In, in a way, we're teaching them and saying, instead of having your car and owning a car and paying for all of that, you can actually rent it out if you can a day or if, if right now with the pandemic, it's more uh, common to see people that they stop using their cars. So instead of wasting money on it, you can get some money out of it. So it's, a, it's an asset, you know, and in that way, the price they fix for sure can be lower than a traditional car rental company because they already own it and they're already wasting their income from other places into it. Hey, Jorge. Hi. How are you? Nervous. Good. <laughs> um, so, so the obvious issues with a C2C marketplace is that you've got this chicken and egg situation. So what's the go-to market strategy? How are you going to acquire users? What, what are you going to do to bring people on the platform and maintain stickiness? Excellent question. So uh, that was actually our first, uh, our MVP came out on January. But our first concern was uh, getting the egg and not the chicken. So we concentrated <laughs> in uh, getting people to upload their cars into the platform. Uh, we've been uh, somehow successful right now. It's not too many cars, but there's a reaction into it. So we just, uh, right now we're uh, about 170 something cars. Our objective is to reach 500 cars by December. And we had that strategy all the way to uh, from, from January to September. And in October, we started to plan the marketing strategy to get the clients to rent through BP because we need at least you know five cars in each city. So our go-to market strategy is gonna be uh, artificial intelligence mixed in the social media platforms to detect the tourism, which is right now the biggest market in Mexico. So we, we're uh, trying to detect people that are traveling to Mexico and sending them the message to rent through BP. Thank you. Yeah, welcome.
Thank you, everyone. Perfect time. Thank you. Already. Next one, we have Randy Palombi from Veloz, uh, Veloz Energy. Um, the utility, utility electric grid will be the cornerstone of the energy transition. To fulfill this role, the distribution grid must be upgraded and improved to allow fast and affordable connections. So Randy is gonna tell us more about their startup and what they're trying to accomplish. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna use the podium, so yep. I just use this? Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. And I appreciate all your warriors for sticking around to the very end here. Very much appreciated. I'm Randy Palombi. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer and co founder of Veloce Energy. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. And quite frankly, it's an honor to be one of the seven LA new mobility uh, uh, finalists. So at Veloce Energy, we are making a holistic hardware and software infrastructure platform specifically for EV charging stations. So in summary, our system makes it cheaper, faster, and easier to deploy uh, EV charging infrastructure. Not only deploy, but to you know, operate and enhance the system, and frankly, to replace it, while providing much needed relief, uh, re resiliency relief, and added security. I can only figure this out. So you can see I'm the chief commercial officer, not the chief technology officer. Which one? There you go. Oh, okay, thank you. So as several speakers have mentioned today, um, you know, we have extremely aggressive targets and mandates for electrifying transportation, including several states that have banned ICE vehicles in the not too distant uh, future. In support of this, uh, electric, or excuse me, vehicle manufacturers have committed up to a half a trillion dollars to electrify everything from passenger vehicles to class eight trucks. And that's certainly uh, much needed. However, you know, now, not to diminish the significance on the OEM side, but we believe the real barrier is in the EV infrastructure. Numerous studies have estimated that we are going to need somewhere in the magnitude of 100,000 public charging stations per year to achieve the electrification targets, which is about a 20x increase. And I'm, I'm speaking about the United States right now. This is about a 20x increase over what we're doing today. So that's very aggressive, right? Even in an, you know, an, an ideal environment. Well, unfortunately, we're not operating in an ideal environment. I mean, quite frankly, today's electric grid will not support the level of loads that we're looking at with these chargers and certainly not at the pace that we're looking at deploying. So bluntly put, we will not meet our electrification targets at the federal, state, or local level doing things the way we're doing them today, but certainly not at the pace. This is where Veloce Energy comes in. We are addressing this opportunity with the Veloce Fast Grid, which is a holistic platform for EV charging infrastructure. The Fast Grid integrates a purpose designed, UL approved battery energy storage system called VPort, an above ground power and communication distribution system called Fast Connect, and it's all managed by our Argo CMS software platform. As mentioned, our battery energy storage, our V-port, was purpose designed for EV charging installations. A lot of the attributes that went into it, again, are ideally bode, or they bode well for EV charging infrastructure. A very modular system, very small form factor, 32 inches deep, fits quite frankly at a lot of places that other battery storage systems don't. Highly modular, so it can be, it can be sized specifically typically for that need both at the time of deployment and easily upgraded in the field over time. The Fast Connect power and communication distribution system essentially takes the infrastructure that's traditionally buried underground and moves it above ground, right? Obvious benefits of doing that, avoiding all the complexities, cost, disruption of digging, not to mention burying assets underground that are unrecoverable. 
So in addition to the power and communication distribution, the Fast Connect is also a platform for other site needs like lighting, uh, security cameras, wayfinding, Wi-Fi, et cetera. So a very multi-purpose uh, application. <clears throat> the whole system, both the hardware and the platform, is highly scalable, right? So you can size the system, as I mentioned before, not only for initial installation, but easily expand it in the field by modularly adding either battery storage capacity or, or, or additional power communication distribution. So you can optimally size the system for needs at the time, not overbuilding or underbuilding initially, taking the guesswork out of play, et cetera as your site conditions change. So all of these things, you know, we have looked at the projects we've looked at, and it's been validated by a couple of EPCs we work with. We're looking at very dramatic reductions, up to 50% reduction in CapEx costs, cutting OpEx costs by a third, and equally as significant, reducing the time to deploy, in a lot of cases, by up to 50%. So real quick on our team. I'm one of four co-founders uh, of the team. You know, we are a very seasoned uh, group of individuals. I think cumulatively about 100 years of experience, leadership experience, mainly in the clean tech space. You know, we've been pioneers in retail energy, battery storage, demand response, um, and EV charging. Uh, the three of the co-founders, myself, Jeff Wolf, who's our CEO, and Mark Yates, who's our COO, were recently, or most recently, the leadership team for Tritium Americas, global EV charger manufacturer. So when we were there, that's where we really got to see firsthand some of the challenges associated with deploying EV charging at scale. Cumulatively, we've brought to market approximately a 12, 12 new products into evolving markets. We've taken eight companies where we've achieved 10x plus revenue growth and had six successful exits. Two most recently, one in battery storage and one in EV charging. So we have a very experienced team. Our go-to-market is predominantly through channels. You know, we have a kind of a unique uh, perspective here because we're not only not competitive, we're highly synergistic with a lot of the key players in the EV charging ecosystem. We frankly make it easier and more economical and faster for them to deploy their, their core solutions. So we currently work with about 40 stakeholders in the market today. This spans the charger manufacturers, the charge point operators, project developers, uh, EPCs, et cetera. And so we've accumulated, uh, we've got about a $25 million pipeline right now of active opportunities, a lot of those at the latter stage. Also worth mentioning that a lot of the attributes of the V-port, the battery system, also bode very well for you know, for electrification, building electrification, whether it be standalone storage or solar plus storage. So we're, we're doing a lot of work in that area with a lot of the solar providers and EPCs and others. So we're seeing a lot of activity there. So a diversified group of customers. From a financial perspective or a revenue perspective, I guess like most <laughs> startups, we are projecting hockey stick type growth. I think the difference here is we have a professional hockey team as far as our, our organization. And, and I mean that, as I said before, we've, we've, not, we've done this before. We've had eight times we've had 10x revenue growth at various companies and six exits. So this is not new territory for us to have this type of, of revenue growth. We also, in addition to having an experienced team, we have a sales pipeline that is more than sufficient to not only meet our 2022 goals, but also our 2023 objectives. We have production capability abilities to scale. We have a 25,000 square foot facility in, in Loveland, Colorado, where we're able to manufacture to the levels we're projecting in 2023. As far as traction, we've gotten a fair amount of traction to date. We've successfully completed two pilots, one at our facility, one of our facilities in Colorado that was operational for over a year. We just completed another pilot right down the road here at Pioneer Power Solutions in Santa Fe Springs. Uh, we've got two pilots pending, uh, one with Lightning Motorworks, 
and uh, another with Shoals Technology. We've shipped product to a number of large, you know, well-known companies, ABB, Swell Energy, so we've got awareness in the market. And we've got about $1.2 million in pending POs that were, are expected to come in before the end of the year. Okay. One, one thing. Okay. Last, the last thing is we have. Can I take? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the last thing is from a funding perspective, we've thus far raised 6.5 million dollars in seed. We're in the midst of a 10 million dollar Series A. Six million dollars is committed through two uh, two entities who have signed a term sheet. So we're looking for four million additional if anybody's interested. Thank you. Uh, you know the time I never started the time projects. Sorry. Can you um, go through how much um, how much is one installation of just the hardware and the software for specifically one charger, and then how many of like that unit of three can you scale up per car? Or how much power can your current system provide? Okay, good, good question, and not directly answering that, but it brings up another point. We don't make the chargers; we're charger agnostic. So the, the actual charging equipment would come from partners or others. As far as our system, and, and again, I'm not trying to do it, but, but from a hardware perspective, again, because our, sm our smallest system is 40 kilowatts, our largest single battery system, is, and again, they can be daisy chained together, is 120 kilowatts. And those range from under 50, $45,000 up to about 250. A average project we're working on now is about half a million dollars. So, all right, thank you. Sorry for running along. No worries. Thank you so much. Okay, last up that of the day, Drover AI with Alex Nesik. Drover is dedicated to innovating applications of artificial intelligence combined with computer vision to improve micromobility and enable its long-term success as a sustainable urban, urban transportation solution. Alex. Thanks. Let's make sure I have forward and backwards. Hi, my name is Alex Nesik. I am co-founder of Drover AI, and we are pioneers in what we call AI-powered computer vision for micromobility. Now, if you're not a technically savvy person like myself, all that means is that we're basically smart dash cams for light electric vehicles, scooters, bikes, uh, and the like. Now, I think everybody in this room is probably aware that micromobility is a key component of sustainable urban transportation as we move forward. And a lot of um, attention is, is paid to the larger you know, electric vehicles as potential saviors of the environment and whatnot. But the, the truth of it is that micromobility and electric micromobility has really outshined that segment by quite a bit. Record growth and, and adoption across both the consumer and shared side has continued to grow through the roof. And uh, cities have, are recognizing that and dedicating more funds and investment in infrastructure to enable the adoption. And then regulations are also being standardized as these new modalities gain um, traction. That being said, over the last five years of this relatively young industry, we keep seeing this play out uh, over and over again, where cities struggle with uh, these new modalities and dis disruption, and they're often put in the unenviable position of fostering innovation and growth and adoption of these new modalities with the fact that they are in direct violation of use of the right of way. And um, it's, it's often met with reactive enforcement rather than what we think can be done in terms of proactive compliance. So our technology is called PathPilot and you know, comes in the form of this little black box that can be attached to the front of a scooter, a bike, a moped, or anything of the sort and leverages or, or effectively enhances the IoT component of these units, which is the brain, which allows them to be tracked and managed. And the typical technology that's used for that has been GPS, but GPS is not accurate enough, uh, not reliable enough, certainly in challenge, 
challenged environments like dense urban uh, ones, urban canyons, et cetera. And so we've come about this um, problem set differently and are leveraging a camera. And so our system positions itself much more like a human who doesn't go outside and says, what are my precise coordinates? You look around and contextually you can understand what is a sidewalk, what is a street, and what is a bike lane. So our core competency for our customers who are the shared scooter operators is to deliver uh, an understanding of whether the, the device is being ridden in real time on a street, on a bike lane, or on a sidewalk, and affect uh, real-time control over that vehicle, uh, produce warnings through our speakers to educate the rider and the stakeholders around, other pedestrians, of the fact that they're on the sidewalk, for example. And also when the uh, ride comes to an end, to ensure and validate proper parking by using the camera uh, and AI algorithms to verify valid parking in designated areas. Uh, another valuable component that all of this information produces a very granular telemetry feed. So in the sense that you're collecting data from a trip that goes from point A to point B, you can now understand much more finitely where that rider is going and, and how the fleet behaves. So as an example here, you'll see our, our system uh, in effect. The green bounding box uh, indicates that it's on the street, and it should be playing a video. Oh, I guess. This is a PDF, so there is no video. <laughs> what you would be seeing here is real-time perspective of the system moving through a city um, and, and recognizing at no latency, so less than a second and a half, um, detecting transitions from a street to a, uh, a sidewalk and then into a bike lane. And the parking validation, again, at the end of the ride, the camera focuses more downward to identify visually uh, and confirm whether you're properly parked or not in a designated scooter corral or um, the edge of the curb or a bike rack, something like that, as opposed to blocking a curb cutout, effectively helping cities manage uh, these the, the right of way, which they, they have a mandate to do. Um, most countries have adopted some version of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which mandates the fact that the, the public right of way needs to be maintained clear. Moving. Ah. So all of this can be visualized through our Grover Corral, which is a very useful tool for both our customers, um, the operators, and the cities that also sit on top of these mobility data specification feeds, where you see a very granular here and color-coded um, feed. Instead of just GPS coordinates, there's additional metadata that you can obtain whether the ride was taking place on the street, sidewalk, or bike lane. This can be used to inform urban planning decisions, understand whether investments you have made in new biking infrastructure are actually bearing fruit. We have notification alerts for bad parking, for entering a parking garage, and a variety of other things that can be delivered via the computer vision uh, at the edge. And here's another video that won't play for you, but <laughs> other interesting applications that our system um, can deliver and that, that are part of our roadmap are leveraging these deployed assets that move through a city very differently than cars do to gather information about the city and um, create insights from them. So curb mapping, infrastructure serving, pothole detection, identifying um, down scooters, which we have trained our algorithm to do, bike lane violations, these very temporary violations that cause a lot of pain and sometimes fatalities to help cities better understand and also take action on those in real time. So ultimately, we're here to really uh, lubricate or enable the growth of micromobility and prevent uh, the kind of knee-jerk reaction that comes with new disruptive technologies. Because ultimately, uh, we want the success of this industry to be guaranteed uh, and, and for micromobility to, to help everybody, uh, both on the public and private uh, sector side. So we can ensure proactive compliance, uh, help with operational excellence in terms of responding to things in real time, ensure the safety of the riders and pedestrians alike, everybody using the public space, and then generating unique insights from all of the data that we collect to add to um, the, the overall benefits of this sustainable technology. So um, if you have any questions, I'm open to them.
Oh, well, I, I guess I should talk a little bit about our traction. <laughs> uh, we are currently working with some of the biggest operators in this space. Spin, being our biggest one in the US, has over 5,000 of our vehicles already deployed. They win 100% of the permits that they include driver technology on. Um, example of markets we're in are Chicago, Milwaukee, San Diego, San Francisco, Santa Monica, uh, and the list goes on. Voy in Europe has over 2,000 units deployed. We also work with Bolt, with Beam in Southeast Asia, with Dot in Europe, with Neuron, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we also have partners in the space on the data aggregation side, the ones like Blue Systems or Populous that surface uh, the data insights to cities. So we're very much part of the whole ecosystem in micromobility. Open it up to questions. I don't know how close I am to the six minute mark, but my video's in play. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you, Alex. Um, you actually answered right at the end my question about traction. A quick one is, d does the, um, the kit record um, like the journey? So I'm thinking in cases of accidents, litigation, it's there to be used as well. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So that's another value that we bring to the table. Again, having that, uh, it's like a dash cam, so it stores the images on board. We blur individuals and number plates, license plates, uh, but we can detect anomalies or incidents based on IMU feedback and then basically flag those images for storing and then, you know, you can go back to the tape. If you identify an incident and understand, uh, or, you know, if this is a fraudulent claim or if there in fact was an incident, you have video evidence of it. Great. And then another one is, what is the cost of the unit for line bolt, et cetera? Sure. So uh, this path pilot we've introduced to the market and our business model has been $100 up front and $15 per month SaaS fee for our operator customers. And we are now uh, transitioning to a more integrated version, so path pilot light, because uh, we had to be a hardware company initially just to prove out the, the concept, but now we're integrating further up the supply chain with manufacturers like Segway, Okai, and the big ones, or anybody that builds their own proprietary vehicles, like Bolt, uh, to include the hardware already in their scooter, and then we just become a SaaS enabler. What, uh, thanks Alex for the presentation. What what prevents these OEMs or, or these integrators from doing this themselves? I know it's an obvious question, but couldn't they also just rebuild this IP? They are trying and not succeeding. Um, so I think there's a lot more that goes into it. So uh, I think what's unique about us already is we have a huge head start. We have several million annotated images, right, and data sets across dozens of markets. And the way you can successfully build uh, a computer vision algorithm that is effective, not just in a demo scenario where you go outside your factory or in your city block and create a, a video where it shows it working, but how well does it function out of the box? And how good is it at generalizing and then honing in um, to a specific market and, and creating new training models. So we've developed these tools internally through our dashboard to train models uh, in specific cities and support customers and con configuration, customizations um, in every city that we deploy. Because not every city has the same rules. Definitely not every city has the same infrastructure. So the ability to scale rapidly into markets and then support that um, uh, updating the algorithm and keeping it as accurate as we want it to be and meeting service level agreements is, is a key component of what we do. We're former operators of scooter fleets, so we're also very close to what the customer needs are, and we're not creating a, a solution in search of a problem. We're definitely addressing problems that exist on both the operational and, and um, uh, public side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, do you want to do a quick question? Yeah. On a maintenance standpoint, um, does Drover oversee the maintenance or then does the entity who has the scooter and then does this device tap into specifically the energy there or is this, does this have to be charged separately? Great question. No, we tap in directly to the vehicle power, but we are down to less than 200 milliwatts uh, when the um, a power drain when the unit is asleep because it goes to sleep when it detects no motion so at the end of a ride and less than five watts during ride, which is minimal as compared to the power draw that the scooter has. Uh, to your other question, we are, this is currently set up as a lease. So we lease these out, um, and if anything goes wrong with them, they have uh, RMA process, and we replace them, and then if they're fixable, we fix them and send them back out. But as they get integrated into the scooter, that problem goes away, because now the, it's internally mounted inside the scooter, and it's no longer an externally mounted unit that we would have to service. So it's, it's part of the bomb of the vehicle. 
Thank Thanks, you everyone. so much. Thank you, everyone. That was the last pitching session. Great pitches. The winner of the LA Mobility Challenge will be announced on Thursday during the closing remarks. So we'll see you there. Thank you so much.